Right. My name is Klaus Peterson and I work as a historical archaeologist at the Count Museum on Yen Shepping. Since 2009, I've been in charge of excavations at Yen Shepping Castle, once one of the largest fortresses of the early modern period in Sweden. But since what remains of the fortifications have been hidden beneath the ground for almost one and a half century, it has vanished from the collective memory of our town. It's an example of the erosion of history. See? Jönköping was, and still is, one of the most strategic places in southern Sweden. Today we can see how the town is promoted as the logistic node of Sweden, the junction for communication networks. Way back then it was a place where the roads from the coastal areas met before going west or east into the rich agricultural hinterlands. In Jönköping there was also a sheltered harbour, and you had access to 130 kilometers sailing route in the summer, and, or the ice routes during the cold winters. So it's understandable that the early kings of Sweden were keen on establishing a foothold here. Besides, there were iron to be found in the surrounding forests and hills, water power suitable for mills and rich fisheries. In fact, the earliest known stone castle in the country was built in the beginning of the 12th century on the island of Vissisö, within sight from Jönköping. Initially, there was a Franciscan friary founded in 1283. In the late Middle Ages, it was the largest, most imposing complex of buildings in Jönköping. The friary was mid-sized. It was meant for a group of 20 to 25 friars. From the written sources, we know several important political meetings that were held in the friary, like the peace negotiations in 1357 and 1466. It was a small family and a mid-sized friary, but it was also a strategic meeting place located in the middle of what was then a Scandinavian Union of Denmark and Sweden and Norway. The things were about to change. A few years after the formation, the now empty buildings were taken over by the Crown and changed into a fortified royal residence. One reason was a serious rebellion, the Ducky Uprising in the early 1540s. It became obvious to the state that uh, it needed a stronghold and a garrison in this unstable part of the realm. But the only minor alterations was made to Friar. The Archibald Castle was used primarily for military purposes. It was never turned into a Renaissance palace. Certainly there were state apartments and a suit for the local governor, but the main reason was defense. The fortress of King Gustav Vasa had extensive earthworks, high walls and a wide drive and four corner towers, armed with light cannons. They were added to the corners of the fortification. The first mention of artillery is from 1556, when the small cannons and the train crews were mentioned. In the Nordic Seven Years' War, however, the brand new fortress was given up without a fight and burned by its retreating defenders in the face of the Danish invasion. After the fire of 1567, the fortress lay in ruins for several years, one reason being that Sweden had to pay a costly ransom to buy back the strategic castle of Elsfoy, the gateway to the west. But in the 1590s, a project for rebuilding, enlargement, and modernization started, ordered by Duke Charles. The royal master builder Hans Fleming was put in charge for the project. Now the earthworks were supplemented with modern bastions, rifle galleries, and a large fortified bay. The sheer size of this new fortress and the plans of Fleming shows that Jönköping was one of the most important Swedish fortification projects of its day. But the project also included the town itself. The plan was to create an impregnable union of fortress and fortified town, protected with walls and bastions using water and marshland as the first line of defense. This ambitious project ended halfway as the urban fortification stayed on the drawing table. The limited financial resources had to be used elsewhere, like in the fortified city of Gothenburg that got its town privileges from the king in 1621. Still, even the, uh, if the town was never fortified according to the plan, Jönköping was of the greatest strategic importance. Together with Elfsborg in the west and Kalmar on the east coast, 
Jönköping Castle should protect the main roads into central Sweden. Furthermore, being situated inland in a less vulnerable position, the fortress was well suited as a central supply base for the Swedish forces. This led to the establishment of two royal chartered factories in the town, providing the army with a navy with arms and textiles. The castle continued to be a building site in the first half of the 17th century. The ongoing development in artillery led to the addition of new outworks with two large ravelins built during the war of 1643. However, the Swedish success in the next war and the change brought about by the Roskilde Peace Treaty of 1658 rendered the fortress obsolete. Now the defense of the realm was moved to the newly conquered coastal areas. The castle remained as a supply base and a center for the local administration. What we see in the beautiful plan, drawn by the famous engineer Erik Dahlberg in 1682, is the fully developed fortress, covering an area of 10 hectares. However, Jönköping Castle was condemned as decayed and not too old-fashioned by the Royal Commission of Fortification already in the 1730s. In the meantime, Sweden had lost its status as a strong military power, and Denmark was not the most dangerous enemy anymore. In the, 19th, in the 18th century, that role was taken over by Russia. Consequently, the resources available were spent to protect the eastern borders, with Sveaborg in Finland as the finest and largest example. After the devastating fire in 1737, what remained of the castle buildings were demolished. The plan was to build a new residence for the local governor, but there were no money for to fund the project. Instead, the 17th century fortification <coughs> led standing in an increasing decayed state. The final blow came when a harbor was needed in Jönköping after the opening of the Jötta Canal system in the 1830s. That meant the end for the eastern bastions and the eastern curtain wall, both being used as quarries for the new Yetis. Twenty years later, the army had moved its stores to the new Carlsberg fortress, leaving the former fortress in Jönköping to a rapid land development. At the same time, there was a great need for material to new railway embankments. So thus, the last visible part of Jönköping Castle was demolished in 1871. For almost one and a half century, the ruins lay forgotten. The former fortress site was used for official buildings, for parks, a railway, and wharfs for the passenger steamers. And in the 1970s, the road was built on top of the former eastern defenses. For almost one and a half century, yes. But after a quarter of a century, the road was replaced by two apartment houses, and that was a cause for archaeological excavation in 2011, uncovering the remains of the Carol's Bastion, together with a long section of the eastern curtain wall and a narrow foreshore along the Munchen. From mapping with GPR, we knew that there were substantial remains, still, this actual state of preservation came as something of a surprise. In the ground floor of the Bastion Casemates, not only the flanking battery was found, but also gun emplacements pointing towards the lake, and there were signs of different building phases and changed plans that could be read from the standing walls. Without doubt, the greatest surprise was the low quality of the construction work. The walls of both bastions and curtain wall were erected on quite insufficient foundations, or no foundations whatsoever. But there were expected timber beds and pine work we found. There were also remarkable differences in wall thickness, with the western and southern walls of the bastion being about one meter thinner than the eastern and northern ones and those sides would be exposed to artillery fire in case of the siege. Furthermore, the walls of the Western flanking battery were found to be hollow, not solid, with a core consisting of debris and dirt. And there was an interesting evidence for changes in plans, as the foundations for a much smaller bastion was found. If these foundations had been used, the bastion would have been more stable. Maybe the settling and the later collapse of the stone walls could have been avoided. So, are we to interpret the rest of the 17th century fortifications in a similar in quality and defects to the excavated southeast bastion? Further evidence for the insufficient quality of the masonry can be seen in the thin sections made from lime mortar of the Carolus bastion. The mortar from the best part of the walls are homogeneous, while the mortar from the makeshift wall is something completely different, as can be seen in this picture. The finds from the castle excavations can be used to illustrate the activities and living conditions of the early modern fortress in Sweden, a castle not in the front line, but removed from the actual hostilities for most of its existence. So what we find is garrison material, signs of training, maintenance and repairs. One research method that proved to be especially useful is GPR, ground-penetrating radar. 
So today, all accessible areas within the former fortress have been mapped by GTPR, thus giving us an exact location for the remaining walls and close to the state of preservation. This information will undoubtedly prove to be useful as a tool in all future planning. As an example, the Gustavus Bastion in the southwestern corner of the 17th century fortifications was the first to be built by Hans Fleming and far larger than the excavated Carolus. Today, the remains are to be found in a parking lot about one meter below the asphalt. The walls still standing are easily discernible from the GPR screen. And as a complete surprise, a circular structure located where the earthworks adjoining the Bastion's map were the foundations of the southwest corner tower of the first castle. In the late autumn of 2014, we excavated the southeastern tip of the Carolus Bastion, uncovering parts of the battery that was meant to fire across the lake, a quite unusual feature, as I was told. But the explanation was quite readily available. It was meant to go into action together with another battery placed east of Lake Munchon on the town fortifications, thus being able to give a deadly crossfire across the lake. However, as the town fortifications were never built, it's doubtful whether any cannons were ever placed in these casemates. And besides, having been built too close to the water surface, we found evidence of floods filling the room with mud and silt. Another mistake in the plans for this unlucky fortress. With the main excavations behind us, the present goal is to make the, the lost fortress visible again. Of course, it's neither realistic nor desirable to, be, to rebuild to create a 21st century pastiche of a lost cultural heritage site. Our aim is to use the combination of the authentic with the, uh, with the exposed excavated walls, a reconstruction, the bastion part, with the item used is taken from the original fortifications, and digital re recreation, building a castle in virtual reality to be experienced on the spot where the buildings once stood. This combination of methods will illustrate complicated matters such as actual size and volume and giving the visitor a glimpse of what once was there and what is now lost. For a final reflection, my point is that the cause of Jönköping might be seen as a vivid illustration of the visions and the shortcomings of Sweden entering the early modern period. The importance of projecting this strategic junction was obvious to anyone. The paragons on the continent were well known, and the modern literature on fortifications and theory were studied. And know-how, like Hans Fleming, was important. But still, this was not enough. Resources were found to be insufficient. Not enough to pay for all the projects that ran parallel. The workforce was unskilled, something that led to mistakes. And in some cases, haste, lack of resources and significations caused dangerous situations. Besides, one cannot help but wondering who gave those faithful orders. Who wanted the plans revised? Why was no one ever held responsible when the walls came tumbling down within a few years after uh, they were erected? In any case, Sweden was indeed lucky that the important border force of Jönköping was never tried in a serious siege. The actual cracks in the walls were never revealed to the enemies of the realm, not until by archaeology today. Thank you. <laughs>